John can take some questions. Um, I don't know if we have microphone in the room, do we? Yes, we do. Good. So uh, why don't uh, people raise their hands and uh, we'll equip you with a microphone. We have somebody right up here. Good afternoon, John. I uh, enjoyed your talk immensely. Uh, my name is Jerry Marr. I'm uh, a visitor from Canada, from Ontario. And it's a pleasure to be here and to hear your, hear your talk today. I was thinking uh, during your presentation about a, a problem that um, some people have with um, uh, coordinating and developing online knowledge communities <clears throat> wherein we have a, a problem that's somewhat analogous to what you described whereby uh, how do we engender participation amongst the members of the community such that they will contribute their, if, if it's an online knowledge community, let's say, where people are exchanging either legal or engineering expertise or expertise in computer science or software, how do we engender participation such that there will be an active community discussion and there will be as many contributors of quality knowledge as there will be takers? And it's somewhat analogous to the problem that you discussed here. So it's not just a problem associated with your topic, but oh, yeah. we also deal with it in, uh, in computer science. Right. Okay, that's a great question. I think um, this is, I don't know the answer <laughs> in the sense, so here's the institutions you need to design. Uh, but I think if you think of an online knowledge community, the kind of rules that are gonna work are gonna be default rules, not boundary rules. Right, say, oh, if you don't contribute X, we're gonna kick you off of the thing. Right, we're going to coercively enforce this. Um, the community is going to break down. So there's a, a famous anthropologist I really, really like called Almond Service was his name. He wrote, um, and I can't remember the title of the book, you know, Senior Moments. Um, but on page 297, which I can remember, <laughs> he says, you know, societies that are successful wage peace. If a government is waging war against its members, it's bad news. <laughs> it's not good news. If, if, if you have to coercively enforce all the rules that really matter, you're in trouble. So the question is, how do we engender coordination that's privately based and privately ordered? And then we as economists have to be careful about not assuming that private ordered means independent of the government or independent of the large society. Because we know, and I'm, game theory has made enormous, enormous strides in understanding these dynamics that we need to set up a set of relationships between people such that people want to, they find it in their interest to, contribute to the public good, to obey the rules. You know, I usually don't quite quote, quote Foucault when I talk before a bunch of economists, but at the end of <coughs> Discipline and Punish, Foucault, which is this book about sort of modern societies and how they emerge, that's very French existential deconstructionist, postmodernist stuff, it's hard to read. But he says, you know what happens in modern societies is that people construct their own prisons. They construct their own cages. They enforce the rules themselves. How does that happen? Now, you, can, you, you don't want to say it's because we instilled the right values and norms in those people. I mean, you can say that, but that then leads you away from what is the arrangement of the community that creates incentives for people to coordinate. And I think the default rule analogy is it or institutions, if Doug def North defines institutions as the rules of the game, the means of enforcement and the organizations that play the game, that we want to understand that the rules that really create lots of coordination almost always have a default rule structure. Uh, well, yeah, that's fine in the back. No, no, go right, go right ahead. Who, raise your hands, I can't, f yeah, okay. Right here. Thank you. My name is Vladimir Papao. I am from Tbilisi State University, Georgia, but another Georgia, country yeah. of Georgia. So my country is located in the region with region which the title of the region is transitional economies. So for us, it's very important to have uh, efficient government, to have efficient institutions. And from the very beginning of transition to market economy, we face the problem not only transformation of institution but creation of institutions because they were statehood without institutions. Mm -hmm. So 
At present, there are some successful countries who countries managed to join the European Union, and some, mostly, many of them are unsuccessful, like my country, and quite far from European standards. What would be your suggestion to reformers of these countries? Because based on your concept, I th think that it's more applicable for the region, like in transitional countries, because many problems uh, now we faced on the initial stage, how we can resolve them. Thank you. Sure. That's a great question, and I wish I had the right answer. Um, I'd win the Nobel Prize, I'd be a billionaire, and uh, lots of different things, good things would happen. Um, I think the, the, the first step in coming to grips with that is that we don't know what the answer is. And uh, so social scientists, as people are just, as people trying to figure out you know, good people of goodwill trying to figure out how to make this happen, um, that we need to come to grips with how societies actually work. And so part of what I was talking about today is, if you grow up in America, you learn certain things about here's what society looks like. It has a government. The government is a thing that somehow exists. All societies have governments. <laughs> well, the fact is, no, not all societies do have governments. And not all societies have governments that have a constitutional set of rules and agreements. They have some sort of form of agreements. Georgia, which I really don't know very much about, so I don't want to speak of specifics or what's going on in Ukraine or what's going on in that part of the world. We called it a transition because we said, oh, we're going to give you market economies. You're gonna, we're going to enable you to have a market economy. And, and assuming, as I said on the first slide, well, that'll work because that's what gets you the social coordination that enables you to get over everything. Okay, we've run the experiment again and again and again and again. But we've run it in our lives <laughs> and seen that it doesn't work. Right? That just simply having markets by themselves. And I love markets. I make no mistake about it. I think, I think <laughs> neoclassical economics is great. I love it. And I think markets are fantastic. But they don't work on their own. They don't engender the kind of coordination that enables modern development to occur. So how do we do it? The part of what Doug and Barry and I did with the violence and social orders was to say, well, what is actually the, the, we called it the natural state for a reason. How are most societies actually organized? Because if we think, well, the natural way to organize societies is the United States, or, or let's take, you know, Great Britain or Germany, where everybody who wants to can form an organization. Everybody wants to can get a driver's license. And all kinds of things. And then when we look at societies that don't have that, that don't have secure property rights and stuff, we say, oh, well, they're sick, <laughs> okay? There's something wrong with them. And actually, Jeff Sachs, in one of his books, uses precisely this analogy, that these are sick places, and if we give them the right medicine, they'll get well. Because, of course, under the right medicine, everybody's going to be like the United States, right? Now, understandably, when people from other places hear this, they go, are you kidding me? <laughs> And as an American economic historian, I'm very sensitive to the fact that when I stand up and say, this is what happened in America, I've actually lost most of my audience at the very beginning. So I'm trying not to lose those of you who are not from America. That the actual model of how societies work is a coalition of powerful actors. The way in which they provide social stability and limit violence is by creating rents. They manipulate the economy to create and stabilize a political coalition. That's the natural way societies are organized. I don't like that in a moral and ethical sense. I just think that that's the reality. So if you get to a place, and we have a, a series of case studies that Cambridge published in 2013, which is called In the Shadow of Violence. If you're in a society in which violence is a real possibility, and in Georgia it's got to be, then what do you want to do? Do you, you want to become a set of impersonal rules with a one in a trillion chance of happening, or do you want to set up a set of arrangements that stabilize the dangerous people. And dangerous people aren't reading, they might go to the Sorbonne and read Hegel and Marx and do stuff like that, but you know, they're like real politics. They're like, we're gonna kill people if, if, if stuff goes bad. They need to have those rents that Charlie and I have got so their incentives get lined up. So if that's the reality of how most societies are gonna be, then the question is, what kind of organizational structures, what kind of dynamics do we understand happening in those societies that would at some point and in some way of process lead to better organizations, that is more durable organizations, that change the 
interests of the people, the elites at the heads of those powerful organizations, not the guys that are born to power, but the guys who grow into it. Right, the people who are really going to influence, who are moving and shaking, what shapes their interests? And, and what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do in Leviathan Denied, is to say that the framework in which we should think about their interests is not one in which we're going to have a powerful coercive state shape their interests in such a way as they're willing to agree to have market-based reforms. That that's a non sequitur, that there's no model you can write down that generates that kind of state. You can only generate it by assumption. And so that asked Mogan Robinson's notion that the masses will rise up, they'll scare the elites so bad that the elites will concede to democracy, is wrong. It's just plain wrong. It's historically wrong. It's conceptually wrong. So that means, and this sounds really bad, and, and here's why. When I go to the World Bank and I say, you know, you need to make elite organizations stronger. You, you need to make the elites a little more elite. What? <laughs> we can't do that. We can't make those... Those, those, the words I can't use to describe the elites and how bad they are. We can't make them more powerful. They're the bad guys. Well, yeah, they are the bad guys. And you live in a world where bad guys are real. You've got to figure out a way as an economist to create incentives for the bad guys not to be real. To, to not be bad. And I think it lies in organizations. The structure of organizations. Elites in life and denying the argument I'm trying to develop here are willing to move to impersonal rules when the value to their organizations becomes so large that like Goldman Sachs, they want laws governing what a mortgage is. Now, how do we get there is something that I wish I understood better. <laughs> and that, in fact, is the kind of answer that I would want to be able to give in Georgia and say, here's the dynamics of how these elites interact that can move you towards what we call in North Balance of Social Order the doorstep conditions. The situations in which elites are willing to treat each other the same. They're willing to adopt impersonal rules. In fact, Leviathan denied this next book is really trying to focus in on exactly that decision. Why are elites willing to do that? So that's my attempt at an answer. I know it's not very good, but. Yep. Jo John, um, you're the one with the time constraint. So I'm okay. gonna, I'm gonna, Ask, more answers. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, a, I'm good. a short question from the back, and then actually one short question here. We'll get the two questions, and then I'll give you a minute to, to okay. respond to both of them, because and that will be all we'll have time for. Okay. Go ahead. So, fascinating analysis, and uh, I love the provision of an endogenous emergence of these um, impersonal rules as being in the incentives of the elites. The question, I think, is related to the previous one. If, if that is really the case, and if there are these endogenous uh, incentives for elites to, to, to move to impersonal rules, why are they historically so rare? And why don't we see them much more often? They're the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, they're definitely the exception rather than the rule. Remember, we're getting another question, then you're going to respond to Oh, both. we're getting another one. OK. Go ahead, Gordon. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my question is about uh, your model. It seems to, it, it places a big, um, uh, premium on uh, creating rents to stabilize the organization. I don't see anything in your model about uh, the formal role of the exit option. For example, the EU has an exit option, but it's very bureaucratic and it takes two years. So it seems like it's, it would be in the interest of the elite to make sure that the deal is not so bad that people would want to leave. Okay. Those are your two questions. I think the exit option is, is, is clearly an important one. And what we observe um, in many societies is what you might think of as internal exit. Right? That, and that's what's happening in Syria. That's what happened in, in 1861 in America. The South said, we want to exit. We're not moving. <laughs> We're just leaving. Okay. And so elites exercise the exit option all the time in the AB world. I just stopped cooperating with Charlie. And unfortunately, what often happens is civil war. Because Charlie said, no, you know, I'm better off because we're in this relationship. And so I'm going to kill you if you exit. So we want to understand what happens when people exit. And then we got to understand these dynamics of the coalition for why it's not. And of course, in game theory, you know, not ending the relationship is always an option. That's, one of the, that's often the simplest outside option that we think of. And in fact, one of the points of default rules is to create more sophisticated outside options that enable you to increase the bargaining space that the people can reach. So I think the ex, you know, thinking about exit options is really important. 
um, in terms of this kind of outside option framework. Now, why are they so rare historically? Um, well, they are. And I don't mean to say that like that's a flip answer. That's a true answer. So American economic historians like me and Charlie, when we go to the World Bank, <laughs> sometimes people send up and say, you're from America, you're an American economic historian, I'm not listening to you. And I'm like, great, you know? If you're 14 years old and you want to know about sex, who should you ask? Well, you should ask other 14-year-olds who's never had sex. You know, so if you're a developing country that wants to understand how to become developed, you should actually ask other developing countries what their problems are. Okay, yeah. now that's a really powerful force. So the question really is how do we disentangle what has happened in the places that have been successful to see what actually occurred? And personally, I think, so I've been studying American economic history for 40 years. I'm, I know for sure we don't get it. We don't understand why America became what America is. And we, we are stuck because I grew up here. You know, in third grade, I studied US history. In fourth grade, I studied California history. In fifth grade, I studied world history. In sixth grade, I studied American history again. You know, I went through this cycle. We had these textbooks. They told me. They told me it was the Constitution. They told me it was George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. I've got a view. I have a deeply ingrained view about why my society works. That's wrong. It works because we all, many of us share it. So when I stand up and say it's not the Constitution, some people go, what do you mean? Okay, but it's not. I can prove it to you, but that takes a couple more hours. So then the question is, what did happen? And that requires that we, we go back and understand our histories in a deeper sense. I mean, I think, you know, Butterfield's notion of, of I can't remember his first name, the, no, the idea of Whig history, that in English history, that we were always moving to more secure property rights in land, and that those arrangements drove English history forward to the modern day. <laughs> Butterfield says, you know, this is just, this is just really wrong, guys. <laughs> you know, this is not a teleological story. It's a dynamic story in which places go forward and they go backwards. And we need, we need, um, we need better stories about that. There are, uh, this, is a, this is serious intellectual disputed territory. There are colleagues of mine in economic history who think institutions really don't explain what happened in Britain. Are you kidding me? No, they're not. Um, and do we think we know what we need to do? Yeah, you know, because if you're an expert and they ask you what should you do, you can't stand up there and say, well, we need more research on that. You say, oh, no, here's what we should do. If you're a general in Afghanistan, you say, yep. <laughs> I'm going to talk to some people, I'm going to pay them some money, and then I'm going to do what I think is best. So there are real world problems of having to come up with answers to these questions even if we don't know what the answer is. So I think there is a you know, call for more research. I think we really need to understand what happened in the places that have made this transition. Because the transition implicitly we're talking about, what we would say from a natural state to an open access society, a society where impersonal rules were feasible. That's the transition that they wanted to engender. And of course, that's not the transition they got because it wasn't simply moving to markets. So. I, I'm, I, we can talk for days about why this happened in America. And when I finish this book, I'm going to write that book. Um, uh, but I, I, don't, I think it's, it's a matter of understanding how these organizations got to a point where they wanted to enforce impersonal rules, where the, the elites were willing, really willing to do that. John, we're going to have to leave it at that, except okay. that... Uh, I wasn't short enough, was I? No, you were. You were fine. But uh, I'd like to ask Kathy to come up now to make a presentation. On behalf of the society, let me get a little closer to the mic here, I'm a little shorter, I uh, would like to uh, read this so everybody can see what it says. It says, John Joseph Wallace is hereby designated a distinguished associate of the International Atlantic Economic Society in recognition of his outstanding contributions to economics, and then it's dated October 2014. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.